Hello and welcome back. Today we're continuing to go through all of my favorite entries from each Eurovision country. And sure, my first video on this may have only gotten 3,000 views despite it taking me eight hours, eight hours to complete. But as the famous Lorene says, don't be bitter, just get better. And so I'm gonna figure out how to do that with this video. Also, Lorene never said it, but I saw you. You believed it. That's so embarrassing. So this is your reminder not to believe everything online, especially if it's coming from me. The countries that we're covering today are the ones that were requested in the comments from part one. So if you don't like these choices, go back to part one and pick a fight with the people in the comments. Screw it, it'll help me get more views on that video. No time to waste, let's get the show on the road, starting with Iceland. In my opinion, Iceland has the performance with the most perfect vocal in the competition's history. Is it true? Is it true? Is it over? Baby, did I throw it? At just 19 years old, Johanna walked onto the Eurovision stage with a voice like an Icelandic Celine Dion, except she didn't look like Celine Dion did at Eurovision. Ugh. Brother, ugh. Instead, she looked like a modern day Cinderella. Johanna's just that type of person that makes you look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh, oh yeah, God used up all of his magic on her, so there was literally none for the rest of us, bitch. But I'm a firm believer that no one is that perfect. Uh, maybe it's just my bitterness coming through, but like the girl's gotta have an extra toe or something. Just over a month before the final, she was only 15th in the betting odds, but it's really the vocal decisions that she made from her national final performance to the Eurovision final that elevated the performance so much so that she ended up coming in second, only losing out to Fairy Tale. Did you say Meaning that in any other year, she likely would have went on to win the contest because let's be real, fairy tale, yes, it was an absolute phenomenon. So she could have in any other year, hypothetically, secured Iceland's first win in the competition. I'm starting off with this entry because it will always be my favorite entry at Eurovision of all time because it is the song that helped me discover the contest. I was looking up inspiration for my trip to Iceland, so I searched the word Iceland on YouTube and came across this gem and the rest is history. I was just so enamored with the idea of a country presenting themselves on stage in a musical forum. And the fact that this performance just felt so Icelandic with a beautiful blonde bombshell singing and the stage being like icy blue with snow falling, I was, I was transfixed. Side note, I also love this performance and her just because as a 12 year old Eurovision fan, I would message her incessantly and she responded back to me and she was always so kind and to this day, that just goes a long way in my books. So yeah, to get my most controversial opinion out of the way early on in this video, fairy tale, of course, a classic. But Iceland was and will always be my winner of 2009. Now let's travel a little east to the Baltics because we're talking about Lithuania. <laughs> In just four years, Donny Montel went from a talented schoolboy with a dated song and strippers in the background of his Eurovision performance. Nobody is like you. My melody, I played for me and you. To a grown ass man with an anthemic, slick, and sophisticated pop ballad. and better staging. Also, the shit I said about Johanna being perfect in every single sense, that also applies to this man too. I feel personally victimized just witnessing his existence, being on the same planet as him, and my mental health is worse off for it too. On a serious note though, you could just see how much this man lives to be on stage. No nerves, no bum notes, just a consummate professional doing exactly what he was born to do. The staging also just transports you to another dimension. That part where he like spins and the LED floor spins with him. Oh. I can't. In that moment, I feel like if I were in the audience, I'd just have some stupid, dumb, pathetic main character moment where I'm like sobbing uncontrollably like, oh, I made it to Eurovision. Ugh, gross. But it would happen. Now from the Baltics to the Balkans, let's talk about Slovenia. Despite nearly 30 appearances at Eurovision, Slovenia has still failed, still failed to crack the top five. But the closest they've come is seventh in 2001. which in my opinion was far better than the winner of that year. 
And I'm confident that if I were to take a poll, 95% of people would agree that Slovenia's entry that year was better than that bullshit cruise ship performance. Girl, still fucking bitter. And I was only six years old. I didn't even know what Eurovision was, but I'm mad at the injustice today. The song was called Energy and it was way, way ahead of its time with a slick and futuristic production that just felt electric. electric. Like the part that goes dun -na, dun -na, dun -na, dun -na. That part just fucking, it fucking hit. It was, it was eargasmic. The vocal was also out of this world with growls. I feel so incredible piercing high notes. And you could just see at the end of the performance, she's like, I friggin' nailed that. Also, that musical interlude, which features not one, but two Slovenian Mozarts just going ham on the keys. I live. I absolutely live. Now we're going back up north again to Norway. Yes, Norway has the most last place finishes at Eurovision, but their winning entry in 2009 is still regarded to this day as one of the best of all time. I'm in love with a fairy tale, even though it hurts. Let me tell you about fairy tale. I was alive back in 2009 when fairy tale won the Eurovision Song Contest. And it just, it, this song had everything, which is probably why it broke the record for the time of having the most points for a Eurovision entry. It's also probably why he won the Norwegian national final by getting seven times more votes than the act that came in second. And that act was like the biggest act in Norway at the time. And he still beat her. He had the looks, he had the charm, he had the catchy violin section, he had impeccable vocals, and he had a climactic ending. And everyone loves a good climactic ending. On top of everything, the performance just felt authentically Norwegian from choreography inspired by the Halling, which is a traditional folk dance from rural Norway. Rural, rural Norway, rural, from rural Norway. Say that 10 times fast. Rural Norway, rural Norway. I can't even fucking say it once. It also had the inclusion of melodies and instruments that are characteristic of Norwegian folk music. Ryback even said himself that the song was based on the Huldur, which is a beautiful female forest creature that is from Scandinavian folklore. Now, I don't know anyone specifically, but I'm sure many people in 2009 imagined themselves as that Huldur that he was talking about. Also, the fact that the violin broke midway through the song, that just made the whole thing that much more intense and passionate. Overall, I mean, it's just his smile, it's his moves, it's his charisma, it's his voice. He may be singing about a fairy tale, but to many people, he was the fairy tale. And that's how you write a song. If you're ever feeling sad, but you're not into taking drugs, but you still need a little bit of a pick-me-up, Israel's 1985 entry is a legitimate antidepressant. This singer actually won Eurovision back in 1978. He came back seven years later, and in my opinion, this, this entry just slaps 10 times harder. But before I start loving on this entry, the absolute sheer chaos that this background singer brings to the performance, it, it can't be ignored. First off, she fucks up so badly in that first chorus. You just know when the performance was done, they all went backstage and they were just like, Brenda, what the fuck was that? And what's so funny is for the rest of the performance, she just completely gives up on trying to hit that note whenever that chorus comes around. After that vocal miss, she then tries to overcompensate by just dancing the absolute shit out of the song, which then leads to her mic detaching from her outfit. It wasn't her night. Okay, okay, I've done absolutely nothing but berate this poor woman. So now let's get to why I think this performance is pure perfection minus her. This performance is cheddar cheese in the best way. Like the way the background dancers are instructed to keep their eyes wide open and their stupid mouths just smiling and agape. They look like they're either possessed or just took Crystal M backstage. And either way, I don't really care. I'm here for it. But what I love most about this performance is it feels almost like a stereotype of what we've all heard the 80s were like. It feels like we're all being transported to that era with the tacky dance moves and the crazy hairstyles and the bright colors and the happy people. Because Lord knows, happy people, that was an 80s thing. That is not a 2020s thing. The whole three minute performance just feels like an 80s total body workout video from Richard Simmons. Like it feels like I'm losing five pounds every time I watch this entry. 
Girl, you wish. But most importantly, the song is just so energetic and catchy, and I truly believe that he's one of the best male vocalists in Eurovision history. And so yeah, we've made it. Those are the five acts from this part two video. Once again, I'll be taking requests for the countries that you want me to do in part three, so feel free to drop those in the comments below. And as always, if you're not subscribed already, subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and like this video, and we'll be back for more in a couple days, probably, hopefully, depending on life circumstances. See you then. Bye.